do so as well. Okay, so this meeting is primarily about, um, a, it's called a debriefing of fall 2020. I had planned to do the same thing with the large and small ensemble directors anyway. We, over the summer, we had discussed it so that we can come back together and discuss what worked, what didn't, because of course everything we were doing was new to all of us. And so um, we definitely have some, uh, uh, things to discuss. And so that's what this is about. And so there was a series of questions, and I thanked uh, Carol for sending those out. There was a series of, of questions, and I'd like to just go down those questions and, and see what it, and what people might have to offer. Um, uh, before we go down the questions, of course, I'd always like to thank you for all your efforts and, and the work that you've done this semester. If you think like, if, if your semester has been like mine, I've worked harder this semester to prepare lessons than I have in the 27 years that I've been teaching voice. And so, I mean, it's been quite um, a lot of... Uh, um, work and so um, I, w I want you to speak freely and all of that and just know the whole purpose of this is for me at any rate is to give you the opportunity to share with us your successes and what we think we can uh, make better for spring 2021 but it's also I I'm a big uh, proponent of you self-reflecting on the work that you've done in the past and help using that to inform how you're going to make it better going forward so the reason I say that, because yes, I know there are some things you're going to want to say and be quite direct and complain, but I would like to make sure that we know all the things that we're saying and sort of critiquing. The purpose of it is not to just have 50 minutes of critique, but 50 minutes of self-reflection and what we can do to make spring 2021 more success, successful and efficient. Is everybody okay with that, the way that I sort of phrase that? And now are we all, so we all know what we're doing. And so the first uh, question is, have you found any particular approach, technique, or activity to es be especially successful in this environment? And if yes, please provide details. And I would say just jump in, on, uh, well, since there's so many of us, maybe um, uh, the first person can just jump in and then we can raise our hands or be asked to be recognized in the chat. But it's a free discussion. No successes? Well, then I shall jump in. I will say, is, is, is it a success that I myself was personally able to adjust quickly and be flexible as the semester went on? One thing I found positive for me, and, 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 it, and it showed something about my own um, mentality and personality, COVID didn't give us time to plan. I know in higher ed, we think there needs to be 10 committees about everything. We need to talk about everything for about five months, put it in front of governance, and then have it fail, and then start it all over again and 10 years later do something. Well, COVID didn't give us that opportunity. COVID said, here you are, class is tomorrow, what are you going to do? And it forced me to re-examine all the things that I know are right and and something I've been toying around with when, when we decide to discuss what our mission statement might be, something I've been thinking, reimagining reality. It forced me to reimagine reality. And I think I came up with some wonderful things. Everybody's still alive. Everybody got their lessons. I was able to assess everybody. To me, these are all successes. I could, I could have easily thrown my hands up and decided I'm going to do the bare minimum, but instead, I did everything successful to make sure the students got the best experience they could under these circumstances. So to me, that's a success. And so I, I end the day with a smile. I mean, I'm alive, they're alive, nobody cursed anybody out, fine. And anybody else? I just wanna say that I'm absolutely sure there's a bunch of things that we're just too um, uh, shy to toot our own horns. And so I know that a few of the new faculty members have done some amazing things. And I would love to hear, for instance, from Christine and from William. And it's not so much about just, you know, private lessons, but 
How have you done your, think as broadly as you can, how have you approached your classes that has helped them be successful in this environment? I agree. And William, I observed you. So I know you've done some amazing things in that class. <laughs> what do you do? Chase him off. <laughs> and I'm going to say, I'm going to spend all my time as your dean tooting your horns. So I need you to help me toot your horns. Because at the end of my deanship, I don't want you to come to me and say, I didn't do it enough. If I haven't done it enough, it's because you have not done it enough. There is no room for false modesty. Go on, William. Well, um, I think the the big successful aspect is creating an environment that acknowledges that we're in a different space and in a different paradigm, but um, just still treating our students even more loving on them a little bit more, um, creating an environment of trust and, hey, I'm with you. Hey, we're here together. Hey, we're doing this. Um, I think that's critically important. Uh, a lot of the students have expressed that um, in some classes, they feel very disconnected and the lack of community means that you're going through these experiences in isolation. And that's what is weighing on them um, heavily. Like it's a constant reminder. It's almost reminds me of like grieving. Like I, there's not a day that I don't wake up and realize that both of my parents are not living. Like it's, it's always there. And I think just this environment, you wake up, you're logging on to Zoom, it's a reminder that I'm not in my community. So I think that's one really huge thing that I worked um, extensively to try to create community within that, whether it's saying, I actually I do this, I say hello to every single student when they walk in, even if they come three minutes late, four minutes late, it's like, hello, great to see you, you know, so-and-so, and then we're back in. And I, I, I think it's the small things that really go a long way that I didn't do in, I mean, I would say hello to everyone, but it wasn't personal. Like I'm intentionally um, addressing each student saying thank, but basically it's like, thank you for getting up and <laughs> going at this for one more day in really weird circumstances. That's that's one thing. I'm not gonna take all of the time, but it, it's, it's worked um, majorly, I think, with creating a classroom culture uh, this semester. Anything else? I know many of you have become successful at technology. Some of you I've even helped. Some people that I knew had trouble turning on the computer are now doing things with Zoom. That's just amazing. Anybody want to share any of those things? Christine, do you have anything you can I don't I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I just we've seen you work from the Woodwind area and I'm just been really impressed by, by what you're doing and the success your students are having. So thanks. Um, yeah, I think one of the I guess the highlights I know it was a struggle for a lot of the students was the clarinet choir. Um, I really one of the things that I remember them saying was that they were missing out on performance opportunities and getting to make music together. Um, so what I did with them was we focused on improvisation and they each got assigned um, a short cartoon and they were paired off into smaller choirs and they improvised soundtracks. And we talked about different improvisational techniques and how to organize um, their improv and how to create graphic scores or maps to follow, um, which I think for a lot of them was a little uh, out of the normal wheelhouse of what we do in in clarinet choir, um, but getting to see everyone's um, final products and how creative they were with their instruments and their sound effects and doing um, some Foley stuff and using their tech instruments even, um, I think it wound up being a really interesting um, final product to kind of look back on. Um, it was it was I watched the um, concert after the fact because I stupidly forgot even with the Facebook reminder that it was that very day it was happening but thankfully you can watch it every day and and it was I loved uh, so maybe we can can take off on the idea of not only do we have to think outside of the box but we're trying to get our students to think outside of a box of what a what a lesson can mean or what studying music can mean, what ensemble playing can mean. I think 
one of the things that are I, a lot of my students in lessons have been saying is that um, I think they're struggling with recording themselves and having to listen back and wanting everything to be perfect. It has to be perfect. Oh, I messed up that one note. Um, and one of the big things that I try to emphasize with the clarinet choir and improvisation is that there is nothing wrong. You can't do anything wrong. There is no right. There is no wrong. There's just creating and and that's okay and you know you don't have to it doesn't have to be perfect or perfect can mean that it sounds weird or that it sounds crunchy and dissonant um yeah i i was really happy about how that that all went this semester <laughs> anything else that particularly jumps out that you how you were able to adapt to the settings and do something quite successful I'll just add one more and then I'll shut up. But um, the large ensembles, we did um, several online improvisation sort of concerts um, that ended up being very successful. The students really enjoyed them so much so that they're asking, can we do it again um, in the spring? So it's like they're building these skills. And Christine, I, absolutely great concert. But I think the big thing is that, especially for performance area, the students just want to have a product they, that they push out into the world. So it we won't be in Hosmer, but just like we created something and we uploaded it and it's on the internet and now let's go get likes and shares. That's the world that they live in. And so it's, it's kind of hard for us to get into like, does that really mean something? It does. I have a nephew who's all about, oh my God, how many shares that I get in TikTok? Like, what are my... What are my stats? I think I remember uh, Charles, your son with his awesome um, movie sort of uh, stuff that he does. Like, it's all about like how many people are watching, who's who's watching this, that's the world that they're in. And so as much as we can embrace that, I think it makes things seem a little bit normal and it really becomes normal when it's like, okay, we're pushing this out into the world. People are gonna see it. Um, that's big for them. Uh, Niels was next. Yeah, uh, this is really great hearing all of your ideas and I'm getting some ideas for next semester too. So thank you for those of you who've shared already. Um, this last semester, um, I did a couple of things. Some of it's similar to what some of you have said already. Um, all the work that the students did this last term was public for all their courses. So they were uploading it to Moodle and they were uh, looking at each other's work, responding to one another's work, um, not grading one another, but uh, um, fostering a sense of community, fostering a sense of that everyone was in it together. Along with that, um, all of their work was really centered around a couple of projects throughout the semester. So in previous semesters, I would have sometimes some content, some content, some content. But this last semester, I really tried to make all of the content streamlined. So for example, students in conducting began to work on their final in the middle of October but we were using that material in terms of addressing all of these other concepts um, within the class of conducting. In an ensemble setting, everything was really student led. Um, in Hosmer Choir, for example, they ended up making a, a, an album for their final project. And there was a lot of different type of music that was on there. Some students uh, did choral music and some of the composition students brought forth music um, in small groups for people to do. Other groups did punk. I mean, really kind of everything, all of many, many different genres um, were represented. Um, and it was really cool. I really learned a lot from them. Um, I think that it was clear that they really miss in Hosmer Choir specifically group singing, being able to do all of that together at the same time. But a lot of the feedback that I was getting that even being able to record tracks with one another and being able to offer ideas and go back and forth felt very collaborative still. Um, and that was a way for them to kind of take ownership um, with what they were learning uh, over the course of the semester. Um, yeah, so that was kind of it. All the work was public. Students made a lot of choices in terms of what they were doing. Um, and everything was as streamlined as much as, as was possible. Thank you. I can also say, I'm oh, sorry, Chuck, go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to uh, say some things about my colleagues. Um, um, this obviously was a stressful year in so many different ways, uh, but in the brass area with, with three new people, um, it cer certainly was uh, 
Oh, a, a challenge in so many different ways. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in terms of like listening to, to what other people are doing, I, I, I think a lot of the things that, that uh, my colleagues are doing are, are, is kind of flying under the radar screen um, with, uh, you know, Clark doing a uh, 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 virtual concert with the Jazz Ensemble and, and the Drew Group uh, on that first, you know, family weekend. Uh, Chris Hernacki was uh, the, the, the total stimulus of our entire uh, PBQ concert in a lot of ways and did the, um, uh, not only the, the, the gala performance, but also something that's going to be shown from Ani in a couple of weeks. Uh, just the fact that we were able to do things. And then Brianne piecing together a brass ensemble out of thin air, basically, uh, was, was pretty spectacular uh, to, to watch. Uh, and I just want to thank them for the things that they taught me along the way uh, about all those kinds of things. Um, and, and certainly made the transition uh, from three senior grizzled veterans of everything uh, to uh, this fresh uh, site of, of the new brass area, just a, an absolute delight. Um, so uh, my, my thanks to them. And oh, by the way, Lauren's pretty good too. I, I, she, she couldn't have, have, have uh, been a better partner in terms of, of helping uh, me uh, to do, uh, to assimilate uh, in, into the old guy routine that I need to, to be, I guess. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to make sure that, that that doesn't go unsaid in this meeting. So thanks. Thank you for that. And I definitely don't think Lauren nor yourself are old and grizzled. And, you know, so, but, uh, so I thank you for that. And for those that I are- did, deeply... I did not call Lauren grizzled. It was just me. <laughs> Thanks. I will just add two for studio. Um, something I did, and it was the student's idea, but I loved it. His 30-minute recital was a, a series of podcasts. Since I couldn't get it all together, uh, he was able to do a, a, a podcast. He took each piece, and now I was able to tell him to, in your podcast, Tell, tell, tell the audience, who would you assign this piece? What's the difficulty about the piece? What are all of these things about the piece of music? And he took that, the 10 pieces on his recital and did a 10 week podcast that I think turned out better than the recital would have turned out. He would have sung them and that was fine. And he and I would have known all of that, but he chose to do it because he's a music ed person. He wanted to send it to all the high school teachers that he knew to say, this is why you assign this piece and this is why you don't assign this other piece to a, to a high school student. So that's something I think you could all also consider. It was great. Uh, Julianne. I was just going to share in our clarinet tech class, Christine and I had the students each week record a teaching module and it could be between one minute to three minutes geared towards like their future students and they set up their own YouTube channel. And, you know, we started with like breathing and posture, assembling the instrument, getting into, you know, more intricacies of tonguing and embouchure and hand position. And I, I felt I had a better sense than in person semesters of how my students were grasping the material. And in going back and reviewing all of their videos, which took time, but um, I, I was able to see, okay, th they're, they're understanding how to actually articulate, how to make a high tongue position, which is different for clarinet than many of the other instruments. So, um, so they had 12 modules and one of them was a freebie where you can choose any topic that you wanna teach. And so now they have this kind of arsenal they can look back at in three years, four years when they go teach. What was it, I, I what were the keywords I needed to say for tongue position or about voicing the tone or, you know, and so, that I felt that was really successful and probably something I'll keep when we return to in person because it was really practical. So, anyone else? Because if there's nothing else, we're going to move to these things that were unsuccessful. Oh, sorry, Carol. Go right ahead. Well, I was just going to say for me, I, the in my orchestral studies and in bassoon tech, both of those classes in particular putting it on Moodle has just given me a much clearer sense of, of my intention for the course and has made it, um, yeah, I'm losing my words, but what's that word when it builds on the previous week and the previous week and the previous week? So it's really um, the, the knowledge that they end up with um, develops as it goes along. And so that was a good one, good one for me. Cumulative. Okay, that's a good word. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
it's sorry this is what i mean that um this bit of self-reflection i love and i love the fact that we're doing it as a group and as all of you know part of my job as the dean is that i'm going to be re reviewing files and i can tell you right right now just in the open that that self-reflection is going to be something that i weigh very heavily because i know we all teach courses and sometimes we make um errors and, and i expect everyone to make errors i'm willing to admit that i make them but Reflecting on them and going forward is something that I think is just very valuable. I allow my students to make errors. Why can't I allow myself to make errors? And you know, that kind of thing. And so I will definitely be always looking at those reflections. Oh, can I give one quick shout out to Clark? Oh, sorry, Lorraine. You go ahead. I've talked. Well, okay. My, my, my shout out is, is for Clark just because I saw the... Um, family weekend presentation, where not only did the Drew Honors Group play, but you managed to include my student who's on Long Island studying remotely in the performance. And I can't tell you how much that meant to him. He he really wants to be on campus strictly to be in Drew. And so to be able to include him was, was huge. So I appreciate that. I appreciate taking that risk. I tell you, I, it's I, le I learned something by doing it because, you know, it, uh, A, you know, he learned a lot about his time because it's imperative that he plays with great time when he records because then the rhythm section has to piggyback. So it's been a joy including him. It's been difficult and a challenge, but I, I guess if I shared a success, it was being able to homogenize uh, that, those, those people who were off campus, even in the jazz men as well. So thank you very much, Carol. I appreciate it. Uh, Lorraine? Uh, I was just going to say, uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? I've had some microphone issues today. We're all good? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, piggybacking on what Julianne said, finding some things that worked during this time teaching remotely for my intro to diction classes, finding some things that I know I'm going to carry forward when we're back in person, something as simple as making a brief demonstration video of some uh, perhaps more difficult uh, vowel or consonant sounds that we don't have in English, that they're doing the reading, but to just have a little something, especially this close up uh, and with a decent fidelity of sound. Even in a classroom, they're further away and they can't always see things like tongue position or uh, exact lip rounding, but they can see and hear them a little more specifically. And I think they enjoyed having that it actually made them more likely to do the reading, I think, that there was a video to go along with it. So that was helpful. Um, the other thing that I'm super proud of from this semester is that uh, in the voice area, we decided to take on a really difficult discussion about our repertoire requirements uh, for uh, levels. Um, kind of taking, trying to take advantage if we could of the fact that things were already a little bit in some upheaval and saying, okay, there are a lot of other changes that need to be made. Let's try and do some of this now. Um, and it's giving our students a lot more uh, flexibility to include uh, contemporary commercial styles, uh, other types of music on their levels. Uh, in a limited amount, there are still uh, re repertoire requirements over the course of an entire degree. Um, but they can not only include music theater now, but they can include music in just about any other style, jazz, R&B, pop, contemporary Christian, country, whatever. We've got a huge list. Uh, and hearing the students, especially when they're isolated like this, sing something that they see themselves represented in, something that they love that lights them up produces some of the most amazing and free singing that I've heard my students do, and it becomes the gateway to everything else that uh, we want to uh, teach them in styles that perhaps they didn't grow up listening to other classical styles. So uh, we had a lot of difficult conversations and it was hard work, but we made a lot of good compromises and came up with a good set of requirements, I think, that really um, opens things up for our students. Thank you for that, uh, Lorraine. And I and because that is one of the things that I'm going to also ask everyone to do. Uh, I um I have been reviewing the curriculum as much as I can, and I'm going to continue to do so. But what the, the what motivated the voice area, and as and as everybody knows, I'm a part of the voice area. We know the students were not seeing themselves reflected in everything that we're doing. It's about their experience. We are. 
I really feel that we were teaching them to live in our past, but we weren't addressing them living in what is going to be their future. And so we had to adjust for the world they are going to be living in, not the world we lived in, and so or when we were in school. And so this was what started us down the path of um, let's embrace all of this, make it more inclusive and welcoming for everyone. And I'm going to, of course, always be, because all of you know DEI and, and inclusive excellence and all of that stuff is one of my big things. And so I'm going to always be asking people to reflect on is, is what you're doing in your areas and in your classrooms welcoming to everyone i know we have skills and techniques and and all of that that we have to teach we, we in a medium where it's skills based but how can we do that but at the same time make sure the person know that they're welcome to be at this institution working on those skills that's why we invite you here not just because you can play this instrument because you're a human being that we want to be at this institution so we have to give something back to you we have to make you understand that it's important to us and let you know that we see you we're not turning you into anything we're helping you enhance what you already are that kind of thing sorry <laughs> I'm, I know I'm talkative. Sorry, uh, uh, Niels. I just want to jump on that too. Um, just opening things up in Hosmer Choir, just listening to arrangements of Billie Eilish and other things, things that I never would have heard a few years ago because limits I was imposing on them, uh, whether or not I was aware of that. It's so cool. I just learned so much from them this last semester. So just wanted to support that. Any, any more uh, successes? or any of that. And I'm sure there are much more and people are just not. Because I'll tell you, the, the staff pianists have done yeoman's work. And I was hoping one of them would reach out and say all the things that they have done. Um, in some ways, I'm glad I'm becoming the interim dean because we had already started to reform all of that. And now, and I was going to make a proposal to the dean. Well, I can tell you the interim dean's going to love the proposal. <laughs> And so they have done great work. And if you've not talked to them about their recordings and how they went about doing it and the changes that they're making, please do so. It's very exciting to me. Um, but with that said, um, now we can move on to some things that were quite unsuccessful and things that we must examine before we get to spring 2021. Any thoughts? I think we got to find some way to improve the Wi-Fi in the practice rooms wherever they are on campus. Because the ones, my students that are at home are in much better shape than the ones on campus. Holy cow. They've got to find a way to get it wired. I definitely agree with that. I can say we've discussed this in chairs and we're trying to figure out the best places to put them in the practice room. That was the discussion. We all agree that we need more, but what we were, but at least the last time we were talking about, it, we were trying to figure out where we put them, where we get the most bang for where it is. And so that's where it was left at that last time I remember us having the conversation. But I will definitely take it back to the chairs meeting tomorrow and that, that, that this is still a concern. Be in the dorm rooms as well, big time. Can I just speak to the practice room situation too? Just the amount of time our students have access to those practice rooms is so limited. And, you know, they have to make choices. What do they practice? Do they practice their primary instrument? Do they work on their secondary instruments? Like when, what do they prioritize when? When they only get two hours a day, maybe, if they're lucky in that room. and. You know, I know I realize they can't play in their dorm rooms. Is there any leniency to that where they could possibly at certain hours of the day, about well, midday, I don't know. They're not going to hopefully disrupt anybody sleeping, but you know, that they could practice in their dorm room. Just some thinking on that. And I'd like to jump on that too. Um, there were students in Hosmer Choir, many who are not Crane students who were unable to sing because they didn't have access to a room at all. Um, and so that, that was difficult. They could usually figure out something asynchronous, but there was nothing that they could do um, during our actual meeting time together. I'll jump in. Um, I'm gonna go back to internet and such. Um, I was teaching in person in one uh, C19 and C123, something like that, those rehearsal. 
and it's just about impossible to sit up uh, with a computer and a crowd since it was a hybrid class um, because of the cords that were four feet long. Oh. Um, so I'm tucked in a corner with my instrument. I unable to move the piano, it's too heavy. So, um, and the, the box is next to the piano. So it was a, always a very interesting setup. I haven't seen yet uh, the student comments and I wonder if they actually are going to comment on that, but that I was a victim, I had no choice. Mm -hmm. So I would really like to see a better setup for these class if it's just a matter of getting 12 feet cables <laughs> so we could swing the computer around and not be tucked in a corner um, right. I think that would be a huge improvement, at least for the comfort and how we can angle the computer for camera and so on for those who are teaching in person. Right. I see. That's the kind of thing I think is an easy fix. Yes. Because, because, I, because I know in my office, the way the offices are constructed, the the my desk is on the opposite side of the of where the jack is and I just called and within an hour or so they were there with a, like a 60 foot thing to to hook it up so I think that's an easy easy fix and if there are things like that definitely don't wait the whole semester to bring them up you can bring those to your chair well I'm not gonna be your chair but please. yeah I'm like I'm, my next question was to whom I bring this issue I even took a picture of <laughs> of my setup to see how bad it is. Um, I would say in the past, you can bring it to your chair and then your chair would talk about My chair it. left. <laughs> my chair graduated. So I don't know to whom bring this problem. Yeah, there, there's going to be a replacement chair. Oh, okay. And, and, the, chair, and the chair will uh, also discuss it with Matt. And, you know, of course, it, I'll tell you, in our chairs meetings, these are the kinds of things that we do discuss that uh, we're having trouble in the practice rooms. There are people because one of the major things that came up, what happens if you're on um, isolation or you're on quarantine for COVID and now you can't practice, you can't study, you can't do. And so those are the kind of things we, we really do work out in, in, in chairs meetings. And so this I will definitely bring to the, to the chairs tomorrow. And I think it'll be an easy fix. And uh, sorry, Christine, just to finish on that. And also on uh, following that, who's who, to whom we, we bring those problems. Um, there was also, um, because I happen to have a desktop, I have been using a personal computer and I'm starting to be a little iffy on this. I think if we gotta keep going that way, we deserve to get all the necessary up-to-date tech technology um, for instance, as an example, in Snell, there is a computer, apparently, and Matt told me, don't even think about it, uh, because it's a really old computer from like 2007, who hasn't been updated, but yet, I do think it's okay for us to have this computer. So. Yes, and I can speak a little bit on that computer at least because there is something in the process or it was before COVID hit of redoing that whole uh, panel, everything in there. That was the discussion and we had agreed to do it and now it's sort of fallen by the wayside. I will say this, um, of course, is going to be a harder fix because it involves money and when it involves money and money outside of grain, it's going to be an uphill challenge, but it is, I think it's worth the, uh, worth the challenge. And if we can move at least incrementally, it won't be broad and sweeping that everybody gets the latest up to date. I can already tell you that's not gonna happen. Or in my opinion, I don't think that's gonna happen, but we can make some incremental things. And, and if you are okay with me saying this, one of the incremental steps, we must address the, uh, the uh, computer in Wakefield as soon as possible. Even if we can, even if we can get one that's uh, 2015, it can't, it can't be 2000 and 2005, that kind of thing. If that's okay, if I I, I say that, uh, I'm muddy on it. Uh, Clark, oh, and then Lorraine. Yeah, so um, this semester I, I was very grateful of the spaces that I had for the jazz ensemble. 
but of course all the protocols and all that stuff we made it work but uh we were really spread out we didn't have the trombones down uh you know in hosmer where the audience would be you know seat seated but uh and i was able to get because of the 30 minute rehearsals we could have in those spaces different rooms to do sectionals and move around but man it was we get we got our stride after about the second third week um but i'm just wondering if and maybe it's because it doesn't make sense in my head but if we are allowing like recitals hour-long recitals in those big halls and then airing it out you know what can, can we get like for jazz for instance i was supposed to have uh you know an hour and 50 for the large ensemble you know uh and now next in the spring i only have an hour for that group it got docked an hour and a half or an hour and 50 minutes and i understand why they're we're having to make adjustments but i'm just wondering if i have that large space can i play in there for 45 minutes can we because it's a bigger room and it has the most circulation is there a way uh to the to open up that discussion since it's a large space to maybe because right now people are doing jazz they only get 30 minutes of playing mm -hmm. and almost all of them were there because they could play in it you know and be, mm -hmm. be in person um so i'm just i'm just wondering if that's going to get adjusted at all or can we make it just for the larger spaces snell and, and hosmer yeah. if that's going to happen yeah definitely we can i will definitely bring that up too in chairs um uh, I, I know there's going to be a concern that with the hour recital, there is one to five people in there versus a large ensemble that might have 16 and upwards. So I know that's going to be the issue, uh, or at least an issue. A second issue is, of course, the virus spreads as people move around. And so that makes it difficult, too. Like when you open it, I, we've seen, we've watched demonstrations, uh, computerized demonstrations, what happens when you open, just open the door and walk in there. You'd be amazed at how, in these demonstrations, how the aerosols, the air moves just from opening the door. And so we did have this conversation before, and we even discussed re, um, relaxing some of the um, uh, safety protocols. But then as we talked, we because we were saying we've done such a good job so we should relax the safety protocols but then within the hour we all got back to the reason we've done such a great job is because the protocols are what they were and so if we start relaxing them maybe we will not be doing such a great job and so we so it was a judgment call of course we don't know for sure but we all erred on the side of COVID's rising and we know this is working so far. And so that's why for the spring, the safety protocols remain the same, uh, primarily remain the same. But I will certainly bring it up about the large ensembles in the space. It, it, it is worth con considering, especially if you're not being able to be productive the way that it is. I mean, it, you say that you get a little bit done, but is that little bit really worth doing that? And, and right now, I think you probably be more uh, efficient if we allowed it to go to 45 minutes at least. And so that's, that's the argument that I'll make. Yeah, you know, in the thought, and I totally, I'm all about safety. My wife's a nurse and she's, <laughs> this stuff's cr crazy to her, you know. Uh, but, but my thing is, is moving to all these different rooms after they play that what I did in the fall may have been worse than what could happen. Now that we're getting bell covers and that's, you know, tightening up a little bit. I just, you know, and again, if I have 30 minutes, I'll do the best with my time because they're doing recording projects and we're actually doing an edited video thing for the opening, hopefully, of the spring to give a jazz concert of all the tracks that we worked on throughout the semester. Um, so if, if we only get 30 minutes, I'll make do. I just wanted to see if we, because it's that big space, especially if we're in Hosmer 45 um, but if not, I'll be fine. Thank you. Lynette. I completely understand that. I do. And I, and, and I commend you on making sure the students are having some kind of um, musical experience, too. Because I'm going to tell you, that was one of my concerns. Um, and it's my concern that in performance classes, if they're not actually finding some way to make music. And again, I'm not teaching the classes. And so it's, it's a little disingenuous of me to say I would like all the performance classes to have a, a performance aspect to them but at the same time if we can make sure that the performance classes have an aspect of performing in them i think it would go a, a, a tremendous way with the students because as all of you know i do hear the complaints from the students that some of the complaints that you don't hear and some of the things that are weighing on them mentally is that they've signed up for performance classes where they do absolutely no performing 
and, and those classes in their minds are not the same as lecture classes and all of these things. And, and I love, and I'll be honest, I love project-based education and all of that stuff, but if we can always put an eye to the amount of time they're actually performing, because we know they're doing those other types of classes in their English class and all their genetic classes. So our performing classes used to be an outlet for them, not only to make music, but emotionally and stress. I know for me, when I'm singing, I'll sing out a, put out a big whopping aria to just keep from screaming at somebody in the face, and you know, that kind of thing. And so um, I, would, I would always encourage that to uh, Lorraine. Um, I just wanted to, uh, something that was a real problem this fall for the classes I was teaching. I was one of the faculty who was interested in teaching outside in the tent while we still had some beautiful weather in the fall. And we spent all those money on those tents and it took forever for the fire marshal to approve them. I mean, thousands of dollars they spent on tents that we could never use to teach in because they couldn't get approved for usage. And then once they were, and we had tested this out before, we could tell that the Wi-Fi didn't travel, even the tent that was in the uh, the loading dock parking lot. Um, and so we asked, you know, once the tents do get approved for usage for classes, can we get a Wi-Fi extender out here just so that, you know, we've got students who are on Long Island or wherever, you know, uh, taking classes remotely so they could also be there. Um, and CTS said, no, we're not servicing the tents. So we spent, I don't know, like $10,000 or something on two tents that really couldn't be used because I wasn't willing to do synchronous in person for some and then totally asynchronous for the other people in the class. That to me was not equitable. So um, so I ended up doing everything virtually uh, so that it could be equitable, but it was um, very frustrating. I don't know if they're talking about getting a tent for the spring once the weather warms up and things thaw. Um, but uh, that I thought was problematic and disappointing. Thank you for pointing it out. I, I'll be honest, I've not heard a conversation for, about a tent in a long time, so I'll bring that up too. Um, we did talk about it a great deal in August before we actually had them and all, um, but we haven't talked about it, I don't think, since, since like late October, so um, I'll make sure we, I bring that up. In, uh, Lauren. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, I had this is partially a question and potentially a, a concern or something. Um, so I'm wondering if practice rooms are going to be reassigned differently next semester so that if a student was in a certain room, they're in a different room next semester potentially. Is that correct? Um, I know he's working on planning, uh, 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 scheduling them. I didn't know if he, I honestly don't know if he's planning to switch people from ones to other ones. I will say at, at, at last semester, we found out we had a few more spaces than we thought we were going to have just because some people decided to go home and do all of those kinds of things. And so, but I'll bring it up to him and see what the process is. I know he's planning to get it done earlier because last semester, of course, we got that done maybe by the first day and maybe not even then but um now we have two months now that we've done it once we know what we how we need to proceed i guess um my other follow-up to that is um i'm sure that instrument size is considered when choosing where practice room should be um but i know that some of my horn players although horn is not as large as tuba or cello, perhaps the case is a little bulky, especially if you don't have a detachable bell. And some of them had difficulty bringing all of their books to practice the stand when they were in the non crane building, uh, you know, um, something to like their laptop, a microphone um, that was pretty cumbersome for a lot of them. And I'm just wondering if that process would be kind of revisited with that scope on even for a medium ish but kind of awkwardly shaped instruments. Uh, and again, since and David did all of this by himself, but I'll again, I'll definitely bring this up. And so, I mean, I really don't know how he did that. I would like to assume that he took all of that into consideration, but to be honest, I really don't know, but I'll make sure he knows it tomorrow. 
okay, yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing major, but just a concern that was brought up by some of my students. They were having difficulty just mm -hmm, carrying mm -hmm. everything basically to like flag or done or something. Thank yeah. You. No, I, no, I, no, I definitely think it's, 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 it's not nothing. Maybe it's not earth shattering, but it is very important because I'll tell you, if I had to carry a cello and books to a class, I might choose not to go to that class. <laughs> um, Maria Lane. Talking about cello, I did have two cellists who had these kind of problems. It really took 20 minutes to do their overall from their door, to get the cello, to go to the next building. So it was not worth it um, to, um, for some to, to do that. So they did, they did let go that practice period and I, Either they, they decide to do homework, but um, I will. It will be great to have a rem that David is reminded that the big instrument, the bulky instrument, it's cumbersome in the winter, especially the wooden one. Um, it can bring much more damage, and I know that our students maybe are not necessarily expert in babying their instrument yet. So I think it's something to be, just to be reminded, despite I think David is, has done fabulous work and, and some just finding all this for us, mm -hmm. but it's some just something to be reminded. Thank you for that. And I do truly appreciate uh, you acknowledging the amount of work he did. Cause I will tell you, there was that, that last week before class, those of us that witnessed him, oh, I'm so glad it was his thing. I mean- and I, also would like to acknowledge all the work for the tech instrument craziness mm -hmm. to get all those instruments out. And in that regard, um, I invite those who haven't yet driven those beautiful red Manas van to give it a try next semester. <laughs> I will say that was um, that was that was Jill, and she deserves great credit for that. And Jill, myself, and Miles, we we had to sit down and come up with something, and we weighed many many things. Do we rent this instrument? Is it cheaper to do that than the, and the way that it is right now? Just so you know, this was the best option. So the things that. Um, uh, are not working. I just want you to know we didn't randomly just do it. It, we, it was a long, at least a month discussion about how we were going to do all of this. And I appreciate um, uh, the uh, advert for uh, people to drive the, the vans. I know part of the concern was people didn't want to drive by themselves and they couldn't bring anybody else unless they were married to them or lived or cohabitated together. And so that was a concern. And it's a valid concern. Who wants to be driving all of these instruments five hours and in a van by yourself, you know? And so I would say too, if you're at all interested in seeing the scenic routes of upstate New York, um, um, please consider doing so. <laughs> Any other? things that I just, we I just want to um, add to the the rooms that are not in crane um, making sure that they are adequately heated I just want to make sure they're not stuck in dorms that aren't being used and therefore not adequately heated I don't remember whether I had any students but it seemed like a couple of times that was a question okay now I I'm have something really quick if that's okay absolutely um, so I've got a couple of things. One is kind of a not not necessarily a concern, but something that I'm meditating on from feedback from my students that I plan on changing a little bit for next semester. Um, half of my studio are first year students. And so um, having as much asynchronous work as they have had, they've really, really struggled with their mental health. Um, they went from the structure of high school to uh, pretty much nothing all week except lessons in studios. So that was really big feedback. And it's one of those things where I don't think there's a right answer for it. But I'm certainly in my tech class going to be putting in a little bit more synchronous structure and just working to make sure they feel really um, supported throughout that. And then kind of along the same realm of mental health, I did receive some feedback from a few students that I don't know what we can do or what messages we can send across campus, but I know that the counseling center was pretty darn um, 
uh, booked up from what I understood and they had a really hard time getting appointments in. So um, just prioritizing mental health and making sure that that stays on top of the conversation list. Thank you for both of those points, because I do, uh, the counseling center is booked under under all circumstances, so this has only just made it worse. And so, yes, they are trying what they can do over there. And, and unfortunately, from my time here, I've seen them lose at least three counseling lines. And so that even compounds the issue. But to the, so, but I will mention that in chairs tomorrow, but to the point beforehand, and I don't think this is happening with Crane, faculty, but we've gotten not only in Crane, but across campus, a lot of complaints about asynchronous teaching because, and, and again, it's going to sound harsh, but again, I'm going to say it, we hear from students that teachers that are teaching asynchronously, asynchronously aren't doing anything, and those are their words. And so to them, sometimes they show up to an asynchronous course and the professor may end up talking, or the, the, the time isn't being used productive. So many students have been complaining about the whole asynchronous thing, just the, the lack of structure to them. Even, in our, and I even say in my brain, even when they don't, um, have that structure and you can be teaching something in their brains just as Brianne is saying they are thinking well we're not doing anything so it's too so it's some of the asynchronous is too casual for their young minds and, and so that's just something to keep in mind and um and so I throw that out there I have heard that from quite a few students that asynchronous is very difficult for some of them any comment on any of that oh, Carol I just want to um and I uh, was spent some time in some of the town halls um, and then in various meetings through faculty senate and an executive committee and the point was made that they were going to have counselors outside of Potsdam so that they could do tele um, health counseling and I know there's another word for that but anyhow and so I don't know if they if you can make a push make a plug for them to increase that um, yeah because I know we're a small campus, we have very small staff in that area, but we have high need students just like everywhere. So, mm -hmm. and I would, I definitely am going to make that plug. And I would also, just on the opposite side of what I've said, um, for us to consider. I have spent, I mean, I'm already a talkative and emotional person, and I try to connect with them, and I give them time to talk. If you always make room to really talk to them. They are some of our students are going through some stuff and and they need to feel like, in my opinion, they need to feel like they can tell you about those things that they're going through. So um, every lesson that I teach and, and granted this semester, I'm only teaching lessons, I leave room for, well, how are you doing and really tell me how you're doing versus Oh, I'm fine. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I know you're not fine. This lesson was horrible. <laughs> but uh, you know, those kinds of things. And so I would encourage you to, to even if you're a person that's not one of the talkative ones, you know, if you don't teach voice, all voice lessons are therapy sessions. But if you're not teaching voice, I might en encourage you to leave just a little room for that as well. And just to follow up on some of these conversations, I'd be happy to, at the beginning of the semester, have a specific meeting or chat with anybody who wants to, to talk about how to guide mindfulness or meditation towards the beginning. Um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to facilitate that if that's something people are interested in. Thank you. Being mindful of time. I want to go right down these questions and because I don't want to keep you and I and I and I truly appreciate you giving us this time, but I do want to make sure you feel like you've addressed um, some of the things. Do you have any suggestions? I'm just going to read them. Do you have any suggestions for things to do or not to do that might improve students experience for spring 2021? The next one in regard to personal person, in-person and virtual courses, there's a whole bunch of things. So I would take anything you have to say about the benefits or or the, uh, the not benefits or the distractions from those things. And then we were already discussing in regard to fully online asynchronous courses. So 
those are all the things that were left on the list. If you have anything that you might want to offer to that, or if you have to leave, I understand. I will take any um, any emails with anything you weren't able to say, or if you think we should have more meetings like this before spring actually starts, that's okay too. I just want to point out I definitely want to have a goals and meeting because I know I'm going to ask for goals from every department. So I want to know what the department is going to be working on for the semester, each one, and what we're going to be working on as a school. Okay, but I, I, Chuck. Yeah, I, I just, uh, those questions that you've been asking, uh, were we supposed to have received those? Because I couldn't find them anywhere in my emails. Uh, so could you resend those if 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 you could? Oh, uh, Carol sent them, and so I did receive them, but I didn't know. <laughs> I couldn't find them either. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely send them out there. I'm looking right at them, so I put them in a Word document. Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't have that. I just assumed all of you had it because oh. the, e the email that was sent to me said that you all had thought about it already. <laughs> Now it makes sense to me. I, I take full responsibility for that. My email says, please think about these things before you come to the meeting. <laughs> so I apologize. I didn't know you didn't have them. I will send that out the moment this meeting ends. So maybe that's the best way to go. I should send this out and, and let you all go and have your evenings and family life and all that stuff. Uh, I live alone and I'm going to die alone. I'm jealous of all of you. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, I shall send all of that out to you um, afterwards and then you can respond to that email. And then you can, if anything you didn't answer today, that would also be the time to do so. Is, does that sound like a better plan then? Because then you can be more informed in your de and, your, um, and deliberate in what you're saying. All right, well, why don't we plan to do that? I will send that out. We will we will conclude today. And again, thank you for all your time and all of these things, I, I, I mean, and efforts. Uh, truly appreciate what you've done. And again, I'm glad that we all sort of are making it to the end. For those of you that are giving exams this week or listening to 150 levels, <laughs> like I am, um, I, I, I say um, good luck to you all. And, and I'll definitely be in touch again, okay? Thank you. Bye. Have a great night. Thanks, Lonel. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Did you, are you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, because I my bar disappeared. No, I'm doing really well. It's been very interesting. I went to a leadership conference for six, six and a half hours on Wednesday, but it was fantastic. So I'm excited about the new role and all of that stuff. <laughs> good luck with the levels i know you have a lot to listen to too oh my god and then the like last year last week all the juries and the audition day stuff like and plus we still had all of our lessons and classes all mm -hmm. day and all the and oh yeah everybody's got a recommendation letter due and i was just like last week i thought i was gonna lose it yeah and i must admit just between the two of us the the and the recording. Do you want to stop the recording? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>